And what we're talking about today is some of the things that have inspired us to be able to push past and rocket through our self-limiting beliefs. At the end of last year, beginning of this year, I was heavily cloaked in procrastination. Like I kept waking up saying, oh, I'm going to do this. And then I found every other thing that I, every other thing else that was more important to do besides do what I said I needed to do because I was fearful. Or I'll be in my car before I even get out and I have to talk to myself or I may call a family member or a friend and laugh or kind of get a boost of confidence to actually walk through that door. So your resistance, this is a new word that I've been, I've been learning about is resistance. Mm -hmm. What are you resisting? So it's like when you're procrastinating, you're resisting your, and you keep seeing this pattern of like all the different resistances there. And, and why is it that I'm resisting this thing? And eventually you'll be like, bing. Today, we're gonna dive into a very interesting topic that I think we all can struggle with sometimes, our self-limiting beliefs. And what we want to focus in on today is how to start to transcend that. You talk about self-limiting beliefs and, you know, what that's all about. Um, I think getting past those is, is just a fundamental foundational piece of what I'm going to call self-mastery. You've really got to understand yourself and start to push yourself past your limits uh, and the things that sometimes we impose upon ourselves, not the world, not the universe, not our family, not our friends. These are what we're really focusing today on what we were talking about from a self-limitation standpoint. That being said, you know, and that's kind of that little person on your shoulder who's whispering in your ear, you're not worthy of that. You're not good enough to do that. I don't believe you can make that happen. And that little person's just talking away and you're taking that in. So it's part conscious, it's part subconscious. But we're going to dive a little bit into all of those pieces and parts of it to try to figure out what are some of the things that we can start to do to quiet that voice and eliminate it if possible, but definitely quiet it and then also start to push ourselves forward. That said, Chris, I'm going to come to you. What in your life, whether it's current or in the past, has been a self-imposed limiting belief that you'd like to share? Ooh. Um, I'm going to try to keep this brief. Um, I got, I, I kind of look at this as a, it's a four legged stool I've been sitting on for a, a good majority of my life. And I'll start with the, each leg and go around it right quick. The first one would be, um, would be the fear, the fear of failure, the fear of success. Uh, am I good enough? And do I deserve the blessing? Well, I struggled the, the first two I struggled with for a very long time. Um, and I've done a lot to actually begin to push past that, um, starting to finally, with a lot of practice over these last two years and a lot of support and a lot of help, I'm I'm starting to blow past that, and we're now pat we're we're now at the point where I'm telling myself, to a lesser degree, am I good enough? Well, the answer to that is yes, I am good enough. The fourth one would be. Do I deserve the blessing? Well, I went from being okay to yes, to a resounding yes. I deserve those blessings. I've put the work in, I put the time in, I've been genuine, I've been authentic about it. And I think that that should count for something. Um, not to, to jump off of that, but you know, it's also about what kind of people I have supporting me. Um, you, you know, I was thinking about this this morning when I was doing my notes and I was looking at it as like, now, obviously, Brian, you're the, you're the longest on the panel. You're the longest. I have the longest relationship with you at 25 years. Um, and that relationship of 25 years has bore fruit probably from day one. I don't think I was looking at it from that perspective in day one. I, I, you know, sometimes people come into your lives and you know they're good, but you don't know what to do with them. You know, I've had, you know, I, I would say when people come into your lives and you, and you, you maybe, and I, I think that's a quiet thing. So I don't think a lot of people admit to that readily. I am one of those people that do admit to that readily, um, that I don't know sometimes what to do with people. But it, for me, it's like, even though you don't know what to do with someone, you still want to try to at least keep them in your universe or keep them close. So, and then you can build those relationships going, um, uh, Vinny, on your in your perspective, from your perspective, from your from your side, you our friendship is you know less than truly less than a decade, but I, I know I knew from day one that there was something to this, you know, something to the relationship, 
I, and I just needed to explore it more. But the, I think the reality is, is having that willingness to do that, having that willingness to admit that. Uh, Erica, you and I, are, we're, we're relatively new, but I can already tell from the time we spent on, on camera that it's very beneficial having you in my universe as well. So I count on all three of you guys to keep propelling me forward in my life. Very well said, because uh, your, your circle definitely matters as far as your mindset and, and, and your elevation in life, right? So that's, that's a very important piece. Listen, the most limiting belief that I've had, I think, in the past was, um, do I fit in? Am I uh, sophisticated enough? Am I? Um, I'll give you a little background. I went to a Pentecostal school from K through eighth grade. So it's, it was a United Pentecostal school. So a lot, it was a lot of fun, but it's a very um, kind of strict routine. And I think being in that setting uh, kind of, uh, I won't say limited my outlook, but uh, it, it wasn't the most sociable um, setting when it comes to outside of that United Pentecostal circle. So I think going to public school, just knowing, noticing a little diff, uh, that I was different, a little awkwardness, and really wanting to um, make friends. I think feeling like uh, and questioning whether I fit, fit in or if I were sophisticated enough or fancy enough to really um, be in the circle of people that I found myself around. So that uh, I think really has been a self-limiting belief for me, I think almost all of my life. Yeah, you know, it, the, the biggest one always is not feeling adequate or sufficient or enough. That's the overall one. And, you know, everything from there in my own personal journey has stemmed to build off of those components, you know, where it's um, how we show up in the world, um, how others, well, how we, well, first and foremost, how we view ourselves. So that self-confidence, that self-esteem, all those building blocks of what makes us feel like, as as Eric mentioned, we belong is so important. You know, it's it's that it's that uh, all those little components, in the inner dialogue that. Um, I think it's just because we've, we've heard it for so long. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times we just don't even think it's there. Or we don't recognize mm -hmm. it's there. So for us to just be aware and feel that, that's the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, it's, it's whatever is plus or minus. You know, anything that provides me a heightened sense of, of, uh, whatever or a lower sense of whatever is how i viewed those little voices or those little pulls and pushes yeah agree i agree with you there so for me i want to go back to kind of a little bit of what erica was saying and the, she was talking about kind of fitting in uh feeling misunderstood maybe so for me i would say feeling misunderstood what's interesting is and it kind of goes back to as she was saying about the school days and those years um, a lot of my challenge with it was misunderstood, but it was because I didn't understand myself. So then that I didn't then know how to apply me to the world around me, right? Because I didn't really understand what was important to me and what was relevant to me and, uh, and that piece of it. So similar, but a little bit different. And that's taken some time for me to, to figure out, you know, why do I not see the world as the way other people see the world at a, at a young age, you know, and don't have the same interests that everybody else has and those kinds of things. And just trying to figure out that piece of it was a very big part of what limited me from engaging and, and being more active and, and doing more things because I just didn't know where to literally plug myself into it and just trying to figure that out. So very, very big components of it. So now that we've kind of gone, we've shared a little bit about that. I want to bring up something that you kind of touched on a little bit. And this is where we talk about conscious versus subconscious. And I think this is one of the key pieces of the awareness part of it, 
because a lot of the times that that tape that's running as you if you want to call it that that's talking about that limiting belief is running in your subconscious so it's it's technically even almost even being a blind spot that you don't know it's there so really taking the time to dig through and figure that out i think is a key component so vince i'm going to come back to you since you kind of broached it a little bit already what would you say are some of the things that people can do to make themselves more aware of especially that tape that's playing subconsciously or maybe even in their blind spot? You know, in my own personal journey, identifying and being more aware of this particular component is the first step. And, you know, it, it's it's taken years and, you know, books and audible books and just countless hours of self-reflection and thinking about this thing, these things. Um, I think the fascinating thing that I've been exposed to recently is by seeing it in others, especially in a in a truncated time frame, like a very concentrated component. It's so much easier to to see that mirror of yourself. And, and the use case I've been mentioning for a while now is, you know, this leadership program and just watching, you know, 30 to 50 other individuals all go through this has been the most fascinating awareness function for me personally, because I'm like, oh my gosh, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. Um, the words everyone uses, how they use it, how their nonverbal communication shows up, um, you know, everything. It's just like, wow, like what a fascinating uh, thing. And so that, that's been one of my biggest ahas. Well, that's awesome. Chris, I'm going to come to you because I want to take it to where something I know that's very near and dear to you, and that's your time in the sea, right? And how that helps you um, I guess, connect with self. So could you share a little bit about that part and why that's so important and how that's helped you really start to uh, elevate just your relationship with Chris? So kind of internally. Honestly, um, that's an activity that um, swimming and just being in the water is something that dates back to my childhood. I was fortunate as a child to be uh, introduced excuse me, <clears throat> introduced to the water and its benefits, obviously. Um, but I looked at, I looked at the, the, the ocean, you know, obviously I started out in a pool, but the fact that we live in Hawaii, I, I, and I'm so fortunate to be able to have the ocean. I mean, I'm literally sitting in my condo looking dead in the ocean from two blocks away. And I, I'm one of those kind of people. I, I analogize things. I, I, you know, do comparison things. And I looked at the ocean as kind of this, the world. And as this thing that this, this beautiful, beautiful being that um, while on one hand was just very, you know, it's just a marvel of nature. But on the other hand, it was one of those things you're not to, you don't play with, you mm -hmm. know, you have to take serious, you know, the water is not one of those things you take, you play with. And, and it's, and it's unpredictableness. Now I've been swimming for, I, you know, five or five decades. And I saw, that's how I approach the water. You know, it's this beautiful creature, but sometimes it's, you know, you, the elements aren't promised. So some days I can go out there, the water's calm. Some days it's choppy. Some days it's, I probably shouldn't be out here, but I have something to, to prove to myself, you know, which is really what it's about. I, I don't know. I've learned to, I've learned with all the challenges I've had in my life that that's just one challenge that I have to conquer, you know, and I have to focus on. And it really, I mean, it really, the, the reality is it's a great exercise tool for me, but it's also an exercise tool to mine because it's very, it's very clear. There's, you know, and there's no phone. Or I don't have anybody typically, you know, I, I do talk to people in the water, but it is really one of those things that it, it, it provides so many ebbs and flows of that process um, that it just, I don't know. Every time I go out, you know, some days, I, you know, right now it's cold. Um, so I'm swimming less. I'm down to about two days a week, but I, every time I step into it, it's, it's a new thing. It's a fresh thing and it invigorates my body as well as my mind. So, um, 
like I said, I can't wait, you know, tomorrow, I don't think I'm swimming today, but tomorrow I, I can't wait. I mean, I can't wait to get out there and just, you know, I, I go out and I pray and I just get in touch with myself and what's going on. Talk, you know, I, I literally have those self conversations where you, you know, what went good last week? What didn't go so good last week? What was absolutely fantastic last week? And you go the whole gamut. So that's the one thing I, I think that people get in trouble sometimes in their lives when they only focus on the negative or they only focus on the positive and not focus on those two and, and, and everything between. And I've, like I said, I've used it as, like I said, I've used it as a tool and it is, it has not failed me and is actually paying very wonderful dividends in my life today. For me, writing it down, writing down like bullet points of what my thoughts are in my head. And then on the next page or, or opposite page, actually writing down um, just some truths and then going to ask myself, you know, why am I holding on to the beliefs on the left side of this journal? Like, what do I gain from it? And what will happen if I let these thoughts go, if I release it? What will happen then? And really just questioning myself as to why why are you hanging on to this when you know that the evidence shows <laughs> that this isn't true or the evidence shows that this really isn't significant to anybody else but except in your head hmm. so I, I do i push back on myself about why are you hanging on to this like what part of you has something to gain gain from it and what part of you feels like uh, uh, the fear if you let it go. And I, I ask my, I question myself about why I think the way I do. Um, especially when, when I look on paper, the evidence is showing the opposite or the evidence is showing that I've made it up. Or the evidence is showing nobody really cares about this as much as you think they do get over yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big piece of it. Eric, I want to do a follow-up question. It's a, kind of in the same vein, but I, I really want to hear from a, a woman's perspective and obviously being a professional uh, business person, you're out there in the world from a limiting beliefs from, and I'm, I guess I'm going to bring it to, to society. Mm -hmm. Has there been anything that, you know, you've kept bumping into especially as a, a, a business professional and a, and a woman that's really started to build uh, a belief in you that mm -hmm. this is not the right place for me, I'm not doing the right thing or any of those kind of things. Um, I've had an experience uh, somewhat in that vein, but it was in a, a positive realm. Oh, good. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm by nature a, a more soft-spoken person. Now, if I'm in the courtroom, my voice is louder and it's, it can be more aggressive, but just day to day, I'm a soft spoken person. And I was at work one day, I was working for national law, uh, this national labor and employment law firm. And I was working directly under the, one of the founding partners of the firm. And so I went to his office and I knocked, you know, his door was open, but I knocked and I said, you know, um, Hey, you know, and I'll say his name. I said, Hey, Marty, um, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt what you're doing. And then he was writing on his journal and he looked up and he said, Erica, never ever apologize. Never apologize. Hmm. Uh, if you need to speak with me, if you need to come in, knock and say, you know, do you, do you have a moment, but never apologize. You need that's to a, speak to me. That's a great lesson. I like that. Uh, that's that's a, that's a really good lesson to yeah. have. I think we, I think we uh, sometimes forget that, you know. Whereas guys, maybe y'all are taught that, or maybe that's just a natural um, react, or, you know, a natural conditioning. But as women in the workplace, we have to learn that. Many of us, some don't, but many of us have to learn that. You know, if you need that time, say it. Just be, go in there and this has occurred or I have this information. Is this a good time for you? 
and um, say it. Don't apologize for taking up someone's time. That's why they're there. That's their <laughs> literally that's their job, and they're expecting you to do your job. And if there's some news to bring, they want you to bring it. But don't apologize. And uh, and again, that's a self limiting belief that many women have, um, based upon conditioning or some self imposed limitations. And I want to kind of pick up right there, too, because the word choices that we use really, I think, uh, have a great impact, not just the word choices and how we communicate with others, but also how we communicate with ourselves. And Erica, that's a great example, um, because you and some people can probably relate to this, talking about saying, I'm sorry. And there are those times when you apologize to yourself because you have a certain behavior or you're, you're not doing a certain thing that you know you should be doing. And it's okay to give yourself some grace. I, we all understand that. But again, you don't need to say, I'm sorry to yourself uh, because you are that person who is a the most accountable for self, right? And that's, I think, the biggest piece of self-awareness. And Chris hit it right on the head when he said, you know, don't just focus on all the positives and don't just focus on all the negatives. You have to look at the whole gamut of what's there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is where I think the true awareness comes from is being open and honest with yourself so that you can evaluate those things. And, you know, Erica, you say you journal, um, but same thing. Um, what do you focus on when you're journaling? And when that one little thought creeps in and you go, oh, I don't want to put that on there because so you're actually limiting what you're really exposing your your thought process to uh, because you can say, I don't want to capture that, but I want to capture this because you want to stay on the positive side of it, however that may be. But the key piece there is to capture it all, right? You, you've got to be able to filter through all of those pieces because if you don't, that same negative thing is just going to sit there. It's going to nag because you know it's there, but you want to choose to put blinders on so you don't see it. Mm -hmm. And there's no way to fix or repair or get beyond it unless you literally just kind of go straight at it. And and that lesson was taught by a man. So mm -hmm. when you guys have women in the workplace, you know, especially uh, women who are just entering the workplace or they're trying to grow professionally into where, where you all are. If you see that uh, sometimes, sometimes the person's personality is that you can't address it or help, um, help them in that way. But if it's somebody that is coachable, by all means, share with them lessons that you all learned in dealing with how to maneuver in a corporation or how to maneuver in a law firm or, you know, show them how it's done. Because at least back from when I was growing up, a lot of girls did not receive that uh, confidence, that, uh, coaching on how to approach those situations. So mm -hmm. if you if you see someone do that, really like a guy or a guy or a woman or man, uh, if they're open to coaching, if, <laughs> then share with them a way to approach it differently so that that way their career can keep progressing and they're not limiting themselves. I, I don't know how, if somebody's not open to coaching, I don't know what to do with that. But if they're open to it, you know, help them. So I, got a, I got a question, Erica. So I, I know exactly what you're talking about because I did do that for a long period of time. Um, and so I guess the question for you is with the coaching, mm -hmm. you know, what else helps you get past that? Because, you know, just that little component of I'm sorry or putting yourself down or always feeling like you're, you know, hindering or, or, or causing someone else, whatever it is, how do you do more than change that? Like, how do you, cause it's just not something that's, that's deep. Like that's deep, deep, deep. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to, if it's coming from someone uh, that you respect, you practice it. You practice it until you feel it, until it becomes natural for you. And it's really a part of really faking it until you really make it. Because if you pretend it, a lot of times people are going based off of perception. You know, they're not, you know, masterful, you know, not ma they may be manipulators, but not masterful manipulate. They're going by perception and a lot of what they believe about themselves and projecting on you. So they don't know. <laughs> 
<laughs> that you're really not that confident. They don't know. They're not confident themselves. They have their own mess going on. But really practicing. And if you, if you have a mentor who uh, pours information into you and helps you along, giving you some tips on how you can further your career, um, then practice it. Right, you know, and you and you notice lots of times we notice that when we're doing something, we notice that it's weird <laughs> or we should be saying it. So when someone you respect uh, kind of gives you some tips, some different alternatives on how you can handle a situation, practice it and see how it fits. And, and if it makes sense to you, do it. Just keep practicing it that way until it just becomes automatic for you to react like that. That's what I've had to do. And there are many a times when I go places and I'll be, and I've shared that with y'all before, I'll be at home or I'll be in my car before I even get out. And I have to talk to myself or I may call a family member or a friend and laugh or kind of get a boost of confidence to actually walk through that door. But if you see me there, you're not going to necessarily know that that's what I had to do. So I'm sharing uh, a lot of this because I want other people to know that how they feel isn't weird. A lot, a lot of people feel like that. I think most people feel like that. Uh, one of the things I think that, um, and I'm, I'm, I, I always use me as the, the uh, example is um, the, the self-awareness piece. It, let's, let's look at it from the standpoint of a meter. The meter on and, and self-awareness is a very broad meter. And in some respects, it's a limitless meter. And one of the things that one of the components of, of self-awareness is the autocorrect. So we, we, I know, Erica, you were talking about referencing and speaking to someone and how you were unsure about it and the, the confidence level. I think with each exchange you have, whether it be with that particular person or with someone else, there's all there's tapes you're going to keep replaying you know, the last exchange, you know, what was the last exchange? So like with this person you were talking, I think it was Marty you mentioned. Um, the next time you talk to Marty, you'll remember the previous conversation and you'll be able to autocorrect on the fly. Mm -hmm. Now, another part of this is, because we're always talking about the, the plus and the minus of this is the practicing of limited pr practice, eliminating negative self-talk. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that having conversations with yourself. I have a gazillion conversations with myself and it's more from the pushing me forward and put and pushing me upward as opposed to pushing me down. And that's, you know, we, when we move away from the self-imposed, self-imposed barriers and beliefs to a more self-aware positive state of mind that has intentions of doing good. I think that works for you, but you have to keep that You have to, you have to continually keep that a part of your, process and as long as you don't lose sight of that you're going to I, I, like i said i'm using me as the example the growth is you're going to benefit from that growth um and like i said i'm to, today i'm living proof of that you know where how i feel about myself today and what where and remembering where i was versus where i am it's it's a joy to wake up now it is literally a joy for me to wake up in the morning, regardless of what's on the table. Mm -hmm. I'm back to that point. So I want to throw something on the table and get everybody's perspective. And Vince, I think this will ring with you quite quite a bit. I, there's a one word that I think a lot of people use as a gatekeeper, and I'm going to use that term, for a lot of their limiting beliefs. And it, it gives them an out so they don't have to deal with it. And that's procrastination. We procrastinate, and it's, it's a normal thing that people do. Oh, yeah, no, I need to get it down. I'm, I'm procrastinating on it. But that's actually, the procrastination is an excuse. It's not the root of it, right? So, Vince, how about you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's a huge component as to how we use procrastination to kind of be our uh, escape goat. Oh, yeah. Procrastination and I have had a long, long relationship throughout my uh my journey and um you know it's funny on on procrastination in particular uh my my logical reasoning brain even evolved to the point where i'm i'm show i'm proving to myself that procrastinating actually 
proves and results in better work. Yeah, that's a fun one. And it, you know, it, it's interesting because we all we all can recognize culturally procrastination is not one of those things where it's it's a good thing because again, you're not giving yourself adequate time to be able to change, improve, modify, present your best work. But yet, um, all too often in my own personal journey, I found, you know, one of the biggest challenges is bringing on too much. So the act of doing too much is in itself a own internal, like, oh, well, you know, I could have done this, but I have, you know, I have too much to do, or I've got all this other things. And so my journey of being a yes person and saying yes to everything and not being able to say, oh, maybe, or, oh, no, you know, it's like, and, and, and just trying to please Please, not, not only just, just not pleasing myself, it's pleasing other people. Looking for that, um, for that uh, gratification. They're like, oh yeah, Vince, he's always there, blah, blah, blah. So, and this is only until like in the last couple of years where I'm like, no, that, that's not going to work for me. Or, um, you know, that I just can't do that now. It's like, I love, I love to support, but not at this moment. And maybe another time. You know, and it, it's really fascinating on once you start saying no, or maybe uh, it's one very, um, uh, what's the word, uh, freeing. Uh, but the other thing too is really interesting is that um, by not accepting everything, um, you actually empower and allow that other individual or whatever to chart their own journey and their own path that maybe it didn't need your energy. And by you saying yes and not putting 100% in, actually was limiting their journey. That's a great point. That's a, that's a very good point right there, right? Uh, the power of no, you know, and I think that's a huge piece is, is talking about the power of no and, and getting comfortable using that uh, and, and uh, sharing just wherever you are in your life and in your circles, gauge that and take on what you want to take on and get comfortable saying no. And as Vince said, maybe not right now, not that you don't want to and at some point, but I can't take that on today. So I want to stay on procrastination for a second. Chris, I want to come to you. Uh, historically, how has that played a role in your world and, and in your life? Sometimes it plays a role. Sometimes it does not. Um, my reality is that I have done poorly with it and I've done okay with it and I've done well with it. It depends on my mindset, how I view it, uh, how I view the subject matter, how I view the person that's in front of me that, that, or the, uh, the goal per se, um, knowing what, knowing what you need to accomplish, knowing the priorities of those needs and accomplishments. Um, I think we, have a list, um, a revolving list that we, I think we all have lists. Now, list doesn't necessarily mean you're writing it down. Sometimes lists are right here in your head. Um, and you have to figure out what the importance is based on where you are in your journey, your, your everyday journey of life. Um, you know, it's common, common knowledge for, amongst this group and, every, and, and anybody that's ever heard me, any of my friends that heard me talk, you know, I've been looking for new professional opportunities. Well, I was in a, what, beginning of this year or end of last year, beginning of this year, I was heavily cloaked in procrastination. Like I kept waking up saying, oh, I'm going to do this. And I found every other thing that I, every other thing else that was more important to do besides do what I said I needed to do because I was fearful. I was dealing with my fear. And, and if you've heard me talk before, my fear is two things. Fear of success, fear of failure. So I was boxed in for a while and I had to work my way out of it. And having you folks was very instrumental and beneficial, not to mention some of the other people that I I, I use as counsel. I so I let's say that I use as my counsel. I was thinking about actually I was thinking about that earlier. Some of the other support systems I have outside of this panel, you know, uh, namely my cousin. He's a uh, wonderful, you know, and Tom, we've had Tom on, which you're hoping to get him on soon. Uh, he is a very nuts and, you know, cut to the chase kind of guy. 
and he will call it. You know what I mean? That's one thing I love about him. You, Vinny, you can be a cut to the chase kind of guy. I, and I, you know, it's, I, I've had to get used to that because I'm used to Tom, but I've had to get used to that. But having, not being afraid to have those people in there, not being afraid to put your, put your stuff out on the table, knowing that you may not get the response that you're looking for, the coddling that we're looking for. So we typically procrastination has, I'm looking for a partner in crime, somebody to say, Chris, it's okay. You know, <laughs> you can do this. You know and I'm like? No, 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 no. I want you to call me. I mean, I may not tell you, I want you to call me out, but in the back of my mind, I'm like, I hope they call me out, you know, in a respectful manner. I think you, I think calling people out is the effectiveness of it is how, how it, how it's done, how it's presented to me. But that has been probably that challenge that I've had. And I'm, and like I said, these last couple of months, I still, I'm still procrastinating a little bit, but I'm still getting it done um, to the level that I'm, that I want it to be done. No, but that just means it got room for improvement. So you, you know what I mean? It's a, you know, it's kind of a, what are the mental gymnastics, so to speak that I'm looking for, but I think that I'm progressing in the procrastination department. I think I'm making progress. And I think that if you're being kind and you're being graceful to yourself, then you look at you, you, you gauge it on the meter. So, but I've, I've been, I've been proud of my, my progress as a whole, knowing that I can get better. I love the idea of saying no. <laughs> and I think I'm, I might make the next 12 months the year of no for me. I really might. <laughs> and a lot of it is, um, I'm, I'm wondering if I, I'm calling it procrastination, but maybe it's also burnout. Oh, that's and a that, good thought. And that um, sometimes I feel tired. And I think we have to address, you know, what y'all said earlier. Are we saying yes to so many things or doing so many things? And maybe we're tired or exhausted. And it's, uh, yes, we can do certain things now, but it might truly be that mentally or physically that we're burnt out. And we really need to take a look at what uh, all we're doing and seeing, you know, is there something that really could be stripped away to focus on what the main, you know, three things are. So, yeah, I think uh, I'm really feeling instead of procrastination, it really might be a bit of exhaustion. We need to approve ourselves uh, of having that experience of exhaustion. I think we talked about it before, how uh, lots of times people of color, typically we don't allow ourselves to acknowledge that we are exhausted. We think, oh, I just got to keep on doing it. Oh, I got to keep on. Instead of taking a break, you know, meditating, going for that walk, swimming in the ocean. Like, good black people go swim in the ocean. What's that, Chris? <laughs> what? I better get in the tub. <laughs> You're going to go into the whole sea. <laughs> but, you know, that's we, we should do that. Because look at what peace you found. And so that's another opportunity if people would open themselves up to do it. So I, I, I think we need to acknowledge that we have a right to feel exhausted. We have a right to um, go and to the to the ocean. We have a right to, you know, for those who want to surf, go surf. And those who want to meditate or do yoga, do it. And, and sometimes what we're calling procrastination really might be that we have way too many things on our plate. And maybe we're allowing other people to put too many things on our plate oh, instead of making the decisions ourselves. So. You know, that's interesting you bring it up because um, the other side of burnout is maybe, you know, a, a, it's kind of a combination of what you're talking about and what I was talking about too, where it's like, maybe you're saying yes or doing these things, but maybe part of that procrastination is it's, it's not aligned with your values or not aligned with what you really want to do. So your resistance, this is a new word that I've been, I've been learning about is resistance. Mm -hmm. What are you resisting? And resistance is also inclusive of that little voice in your mind. So it's like when you're procrastinating, you're resisting, you're, you're not trying to do this. So like just noticing you're resisting, just noticing all these things, and just wondering, okay, you know, I've noticed this. Uh, 
you know, and you log it in there and you keep seeing this pattern of like all the different resistances there. And then eventually one day you're like, okay, you know, where in my life has this blah mm. and, uh, and, and, and why is it that I'm resisting this thing? And eventually you'll be like, bing, mm. you know, and it's just, okay, that's where it is. And it's, it's some, probably some trauma you've had. My initial thought was, when we talk about when we you mentioned the word resistance or and and obviously we're talking about procrastination is that it's really about being true to yourself what makes you tick what what speaks to you i talk about that a lot of times just in conversation does and does something speak to you does something serve you and i don't think as we went growing up we put things in those types of terms i know i didn't you know i mean this is this is me of now a decade you know working on a decade of does something serve me you know is it true to my, my core of who i am and what i'm about you know i'm i'm um i can't speak for you know and i don't want to make this a, a man or a woman thing but you know i've been reading i've been watching a lot of video and and the, the overarching thing is men are pretty simple creatures so we have certain things that we you know if you're being honest with yourself we have certain things that we really enjoy for me it's gym golf swim cooking um being social to a certain degree on certain days certain days i don't want to be social at all certain days if i don't have to talk to anybody i'm not going to talk to anybody and i'm happy with that uh, but just just understanding that about yourself um i think is a big thing i mean it really is like i said i'm a you know I, we've talked about in the past about creating uh recreating of habits um i'm there now i mean i've like literally i've had these last two months, two, two and a two, two months and change have been about me recreating the habits, the things that make me happy, that speak to me, that serve me. And I'm it's putting me in a pretty good place moving forward. I mean, I I I, I can actually say that I'm most mornings I'm waking up happy because I've mm-hmm. I've gotten back to the true core of who I am and and what speaks to me and what serves me. Um and I think a lot of people because we get caught up in all these activities and all these these requirements and these obligations and things like that that we end up you end up losing yourself mm-hmm. and and it's easily done if you're if you're not paying attention you can lose yourself in the universe per se not your universe the the overarching universe mm-hmm. and i think a lot of people get in trouble and then you look up and you're unhappy because you kept saying yes, or you did, or in your case, Erica, you're saying, I'm working on saying no. <laughs> well, that's one of the things I've been working on for years now. And it's, it's you know, and I'll, I'll be honest, it's not like it feels any, you know, some days it feels really good to say no. And sometimes you, even though you know no is the answer, you don't feel good about it. But you know that if you're about you and your self preservation, then no has to be the, that has to be the answer. So, mm-hmm. Doing the right thing doesn't always feel right, but that doesn't make it any less right. One hundred percent. So I want to share an interesting piece of psychology for myself. All right. So talking about procrastination and and this whole self awareness piece of it. um, Mm -hmm. One of the things that I coined a phrase for myself years ago. It's probably in my twenties, and I've been using it all my life. And I call myself a rebel without a cause. (laughs) <laughs> and that really has been one of the veins that's run through my life that has really caused me some joy and some pain. But what that, what I have determined that it is, is there are things I know I need to do or I want to accomplish or I get to get done. And I will rebel against myself because I am a rebel without a cause, if that makes any psychological sense at all. But I'm so aware of it now. And when that trigger goes off, it's like, there you go in that rubble without a cause again. So it's, again, that internal conversation that I'm having with self to get myself back on track. So I guess the most important thing we're saying to our audience out there is we're not sitting here saying that you can necessarily fix all of these things, but what we want you to do is to become aware so that when those triggers do happen, that you're comfortable taking some type of corrective steps so that you can move yourself forward. Because uh, it may not ever go away. You might not always have to wrestle with it, but the key is if you are aware of it, now you have the power, I think, to do something about it. 
So I just wanted to kind of share that from my mm -hmm. standpoint because I still deal with that day in, day out. It's like you're just rebelling. Stop it. Mm -hmm. All right, get back on task and, you know, move, move your way through it. Uh, that said, I want to kind of transition a little bit because well, I think we're at a stage right now. We've, we've kind of talked about the, what it is to have the limiting beliefs and where they've come from and then how that's impacted us. Now let's talk about ways forward. I really want to get into that a little bit. So one of the first things I want to throw out on the table is just talking about learn to focus on the uh, action and not necessarily the result. And I think that's another thing that holds people back is they immediately look at something and they have a task, something they want to accomplish, a place they want to get to. And then they immediately jump from there to the end. Mm -hmm. And they go, whoa, that, that's big or that's a lot. I don't know how to deal with it. So then they do nothing. And I think so that's the place to start, in my opinion, is with the action to get you there and focus on that versus the net result. So Vince, I'm going to come to you. What are your thoughts on just that piece of it and getting the action steps going? Mm. Well, you know, we've talked about this a couple of times and it, for me, it's really been, you know, that whole mentorship piece that Erica brought up. Um, and I guess, you know, it was interesting. I was, I was thinking about this in order to be, to have a coach or to be coachable, you have to be willing to be vulnerable and you have to have that mindset of saying, you know, I'm, I'm unhappy with my current state or I'm not being fulfilled in my life. And, you know, we often hear about these things of like, sometimes you just got to hit rock bottom. And, you know, as much as it sounds like maybe rock bottom again is different for everyone. And, and as you said, Brian, I am not prescribing that I am, I have, I have figured stuff out. I mean, it's, it's a lifelong journey. You know, so us sharing this is purely like where we are currently in, in at least my phase of life and my own personal awareness that I'm figuring out my own demons, et cetera. So, but it's, it, you know, I have to say I'm loving the ride. I'm loving the journey. You know, what that, the age old statement of like, you know, it's not about the destination. It's about whatever it is. I can't remember, but the journey. Yeah, it's just, it's so much fun to be able, and, and you know what, it's so much fun because I'm doing it with other people. That's a piece. That's the piece where I'm just like, I was just lonely, lonely doing it myself. Before we even get to books on the action, we have to go into what we actually believe. And then uh, that belief should propel us to actually take action. But if you don't believe it to be true, or possible, then you're not going to do it. You're just not. Mm -hmm. You're not. Or at least, you know, even if you, you get paid to do it, you're not going to give it your best. Like you have to have a belief that this is who you are. Now, you don't, it, it, if you look in the mirror, <laughs> you can't listen to see it physically, but you have to have a belief internally that this is who you are. If you are, um, uh, a rock star, you know, you have to believe that I am a rock star. Just like I, I remember, what was it? Was it? Um, I think it was Little Richard. He was receiving an award, and Mick Jagger was in the audience. And then Little Richard's like, "Hey, Mick, remember when y'all were coming to my hotel room? Y'all were sleeping on the floor." <laughs> but they knew, they knew that they were rock star. They knew, and they wanted to be around people who had that energy, and. I think that's a part of it. You have to believe it. Even if you don't see it, you have to believe, you have to know what's inside of you. And then you have to put yourself around those who are that. And then by being around, you get their energy. And then that causes you to do more action. If you've been practicing in your garage, you're going to do more practice in your garage. You're going to actually be around and see how they do it. And then you start acting. It just starts kind of rubbing off on you, but just like Mick Jagger and when they were when they were um, young men, pretty much coming out of childhood, felt like they wanted to be around these people so much. They wanted to watch how they these artists, how they function, how they walk, how they dress, how they played, how they interacted with the band. Uh, that they 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 wanted to, if they if they had to sleep on the floor. They, they believe they could get, if they had to sleep on the floor just to be around these people, that they were willing to do it. 
so we have to not just believe that we are that, but be willing to humble ourselves to do what we need to do to be in uh, in uh, open to those opportunities by being at those places. Even if you know you're you're a, a broke student, you're <laughs> a broke musician. <laughs> Just, just humble yourself and and let people know that you admire them, be around them, you know, whatever you can can do to have an opportunity to watch an artist or who, whether you're a musician, you're a painter, you're a sculptor, you're a business person, uh, be around that energy and and then let that propel you to take action on to be who you already know you are on the inside. Well, I think the first step in this, in the journey, we're going to, let's label this as the journey. The first step in the journey is to, to accept where you are or are not. Um, so true. And then beyond that is for me, it's, it's setting of goals and keeping those goals in an everyday part of my thought processes, the mind's eye, what does the mind's eye see? You know, what it, with, if you put all those three components, is what what does your mind's eye see? You know, obviously, we're talking about more more of where we're not versus where we we, we desire to go. Uh, I know in practical application points, um, I use the gym as one of my barometers to move forward. It's the easiest thing for me to to gain results on if I'm when I lock in. Now, I'm gonna get a little wordy here for a minute. Um, as all you, as, as most of you are aware, I'm looking at some professional situations that I, where I'm desiring to be, I'm not there yet. Um, they haven't borne the fruit that I'm looking for, but through this whole process, I've actually been able to find, um, more direction as to where I'm really want to go. I started out in one place like, Oh, I want to do this. And through meetings and conversations and whatnot it's the same direction but it's it's a little higher so i start i set the bar low and through the conversations and through the research and through just the growth process and the journey i figured out that i i can go higher and more importantly i want to go higher so now i'm like I'm locking in on that and I'm preparing for that. And the conversations I've had with the people that I've had the conversations with have been some of this is a patience thing. I'm going to have to be a little patience where I'm, where I'm, my ultimate goal, I'm going to have to be a little patient to get, I'm going to have to exhibit some patience to get there. But what that allows me to do is it allows me to, to prepare for what I actually want. Because it's going to take a little bit of, you know, I'm going to have to do some self-improvement. I'm going to have to do some more studies and things of that nature. But I can clearly see where it is I'd like to go or I'd like to be. Now it's it's incumbent on me to put in the work. And I'm ready so, to do it. So actually, I have a really interesting question for you as you're talking about this thing. Um, as you try to reach this higher barrier or this higher goal, which... I know you can do it. We all know you can do it. You need to know you can do it, which you do. Is is the preparation the whole picture or is it is it trying to get another stepping stone to get to this other one as being the greatest impact to give you the self-confidence that you can do it? Like, like I see you doing the preparation side, but maybe the question is like, maybe you need to do a like a smaller stepping stone, you know? to get that experience side. Well, I'm glad you said that. I'm prepared for that. Yeah. I actually think that's going to, that's going to be a part of this process. Yeah. I'm going to probably have to do a little drop off for a minute and, you know, slide into another, you know, potentially slide into another slot. Here's mm -hmm. the deal. I'm realistic enough to understand that it's going to take a little bit of time and mm -hmm. I can't allow that to just, you know, stop me from gaining the experience. So in other words, there may be on the way to this, this overarching goal, there may be an offer, an opportunity in between that I need to be prepared to grab onto. 
and I'll be honest with you, I am prepared to grab onto it. I that's the you know it's the it's the default, but I'm I'm ready. I mean, I'm ready to do that. I so there's no so in other words, if 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 my phone rang tomorrow and like, hey, we got this other opportunity for you, it's not the one you that you that you that you've been, you know, clamoring for. Are you willing to go? I'm like, yeah, as long as it's it serves me in this in this growth process, I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm ready. To, I'm ready to put all my chips in the game because I think it's I think it's part of that process. But you have to be wise enough to see that. You have to be wise enough to understand that. And more importantly, you have to be wise enough to pull the trigger on it. And I believe I am. I want to go back to what Erica was saying about belief. And I think that's very important. What you believe is it drives a lot of what goes on. So I think that's an important piece of it. The other thing is uh, talking about finding your why. What is what is the thing that you want to do? And I think, Vince, you kind of hit on that a little bit is, you know, what is it that uh, at your core, or are you trying to achieve? Who do you want to be? Really figuring that piece of it out. So when you can marry those two things together, that's when you have a purpose, right? Mm-hmm. What you what your beliefs are, what you value, and then also um, kind of your your why piece of it. You know, why do I want to do this? So now you've got this purpose that you can go out there and attack. So I think that's a key piece to be able to push through that ceiling uh, and whatever those self-imposed limitations are, because that will give you, I think, just this level of confidence. You know what your beliefs are, your values, where do you want to get to, why you want to get there. And then I think the last thing that you need to try to manage in that process, and I'll open this up to the group, and that's talking about expectations, right? Because that's where I think we can build either a climb that's too steep or maybe a slippery slope on the other side, depending on how we put those expectations together. So um, events, I'll come to you and tell me a little bit just about as we build this and as we work our way through it, the importance of maintaining uh, our expectations and how we structure those. You know, expectations in my journey has been one of those things where a lot, most of it has been negative. So my own internal expectation of my own belief of I should be doing this, or a lot of it's keeping up with the Joneses. So <clears throat> when you think about, or when I think about, you know, high school, oh, I should be here, or I'm not there. So then I'm, you know, here or, or whatever. And usually majority of the time, it's never above, it's always below. So then, you know, that adds to these, these, these internal self-doubts of not being good enough. And then, um, and then you go to college and then you graduate and then you realize, wow, as you evolve in this thing, like all that stuff is all BS. And, you know, um, the real world doesn't work that way. And sure, it's nice to be nice to have gone to an, uh, you know, an Ivy League or, you know, again, it's about the culture. It's about the people you want to keep around and it's all the great, but, you know, today it's, it's like, people don't treat in, 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 in theory, people don't treat you any differently based off of where you, all these other things too. So the internal expectation that, that you hold your bar higher, um, you know, that's a belief system that comes in from, from past, from our parents and from other parents. And, you know, it's, um, Part of it's really part of it's good because it, it's it's about setting goals and striving and pushing yourself. Um, but a lot of it, a lot of it in my book, can be bad because it's um, unfortunately not constructive. It's not positive. It's it's toxic. And so that's the piece to me where you know whatever you have, uh, if it's centered in love and support and kindness and being honest with yourself and being kind to yourself. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's like, would you talk to your internal self the way you talk to your kids, you know, or someone you love and that, that mindset shift of change, it's like, wow, uh, the internal dialogue that one has is actually not very kind. Um, interestingly, going back to the no, (laughs) I think sometimes we remain so busy that we don't stop to actually ask ourselves, what are our expectations? Like, what are the expectations? 
Um, when it comes to other people, expectations towards other people, I think lots of times um, you can pay attention and listen. Even before people show you by action, you can actually listen if you listen more than talk. And then they're going to oftentimes subconsciously tell you what you can expect. You know, there, sometimes there are people that are so smooth that they can conceal it, but they can, they usually will tell on themselves even before you can see the action. You watch and then usually the action will follow up their words. I think lots of times we don't want to hear what they're saying because we're posing upon them what we need from them rather than what they're saying they can give, what they're saying they will do. And it, 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 lots of times people will be like, well, she's a dog or he's a dog or, well, no, they shared with you already. If you listen, they've already shared what they're about before they showed what they're about. But we weren't listening because we were wanting it to be something else and not necessarily expecting it, but there was something in us that needed it to be. Not expected, but internally we needed it to be something different than what they said. And when their actions show, or, and when their actions are in alignment with their words, we want to act like we didn't hear it. Like, they're like we want to act like we didn't hear it when they said it from the go. Um, and it kind of goes back on the end and to the inside, our expectations from our, ourselves. Sometimes we don't want to hear ourselves. And we say yes or we say no, but ourselves is telling us, literally ourselves is telling us what we can expect from ourselves, but we don't want to hear it. <laughs> yep. We don't want to hear yeah. ourselves. And then we're upset or disappointed in ourselves. When yeah. ourselves literally told us what ourselves is not or will not or would never or don't have any intention of doing, but we didn't listen before. Yeah, yeah we, we didn't hear ourselves. <laughs> personal experience dealing with me and what I've learned from uh, dealing with other people and then what I've witnessed with people interacting amongst each other. A lot of times we hear the person says it and we don't hear it or li want to listen. We, we listen, but we don't want to necessarily hear it and internalize what they're expressing. And then a lot of times we'll tell ourselves, ourselves will tell ourselves really what's about to happen, what's about to go down, and what's not going to go down. And we lie to ourselves about what we can expect. But usually we, ourselves will tell ourselves exactly what we can expect from ourselves. Well, first and foremost, expectations are a, it's an everyday part of, your, uh, part of the journey. It's, it's uh, I think expectations have to be steeped in some type of reality. Uh, I mean, we can all, you know, I can tell you, hey, I want to be the president of the United States, even though I really don't. Um, but that's a little far fetched that, you know, I, you know, I'd be the next Obama. But I think real, realistically, you've got to sit back and look at and this is part of being self-aware, um, understanding where you are in the life cycle, um, understanding you know, if you, if you, you know, setting, um, I said that earlier about setting goals, but more importantly, setting realistic goals. So um, you can set yourself up for failure. You can set yourself up for success. Um, you know, it's, I, I also hearken to another word, pressure. I know we've heard the old expression, pressure either, either makes diamonds or busts pipes. And it's, it's such a truism. And you've got to look at yourself and say, if I put too much, you know, I used to be famous for putting all this pressure on top of my head and it, it was just a recipe for implosion. And I got to the part as I grew and I, and I'm on, obviously I'm on a, I'm on a continual growth pattern is that resetting those expectations on a, you know, sometimes it's daily, sometimes it's weekly, sometimes it's monthly. You've got to, you've got to take your sample sizes and actually work with them and say, okay, so I did this and I, and I got this result. I did this and I got this result. I did this and I got nothing. I did this and I got a whole lot of negativity. And you, you, I think as individuals, we have the ability to set our own table if we're, if we're conscious of that, what that table is. And more importantly, what 
that proverbial meal that we're trying to serve is. So it really requires you to adjust, readjust, reassess, um, reevaluate the whole nine. And it's, it's a, you know, it's a constantly a constant moving part that has to be fed and oiled and massaged. Uh, sometimes it just needs to be shut off. Um, and it, it's a, it's a lot of work at the end of the day, but if you are committed, you have, you have a good, you have a better, better than average chance of succeeding in whatever it is you're trying to do. But the other part is we've got to give ourselves some grace. We've got to give ourselves some kindness. We have to, we have to love ourselves. You can't expect the rest of the world to love you. One thing I've learned is everybody is not going to love you no matter how lovable you believe you are. Cause I believe I'm lovable. But I realize that everybody, I you. everybody can't love me, you know what I mean? In the manner that I want to be loved, you take the bits and the pieces and you cobble it together sometimes. So it's not a perfect science. Never has been, never will be. So I want to transition to the last thing I want to get into in this episode, uh, talking about getting through our limiting beliefs, and that is energy. Uh, and basically where we should be spending or applying our energies and our efforts, right? Because I think that's a, that's a key component to it. And it goes back to so much of what we have already talked about today. When Erica was talking about maybe it's because we're overworked and we're overburdened, so we don't have the energy. Chris was talking about going to the ocean and gaining energy, all these different types of things. So managing your energy and then also where you use that energy, I think is a key piece to your success as you work your way forward from getting through these barriers. Uh, so I wanna start by saying this, uh, from a using your energy standpoint, um, start to really evaluate the different things in your life. And this is soup to nuts. So family, career, friends, social circles, whatever else it might be, and start to really look at things in three different lights things that you have complete control over meaning you push the button the action happens no one else needs to get involved it's no one else's choice you 100 percent control it the second piece would be where you have influence so you have an influence you have a voice you have a vote that's another piece you can look at and the third and final one is some where you have no influence no control so when you start to compartmentalize the different things in your life and different things you have to address, I think in those three ways, then you say, where should my energy go? Your energy should obviously be spent, and this is where the old 80-20 rule comes in, 80% of your energy should be spent on those things that you have full control over, right? Take that 20% where you have influence, spend it there, and all of those things that you have no influence, no control, why are you spending energy on something that you have zero influence and zero control? Psychologically, unfortunately, that's where a lot of us get stuck is we get attached to these things in our lives that we're trying to control and manipulate, man maneuver in different ways, but we actually have zero influence and zero control over it. And that's where I think a lot of the ne negativity and frustration comes from. So that's a tip about energy from my chair. And then Vince, I know we've talked a little bit about energy levels, so I'm gonna to come to you next and have you share your thoughts on it. But again, what you have total control over, where you have influence, and then those areas where you have neither of those two, don't waste your energy there because you're really not gonna gain. And that's gonna, I think, set a negative tone, which could send you into that spiral of why can't I get this done? And you, the little person starts chirping in your ear all over again. So that's just my perspective and my thoughts about how and what are the best ways to use your energy. Vince, what do you think about that? You know, there's so much literature and recommendations on this component because, you know, when you're when your mind and your whole being is in this fight or flight mode, um, especially when you are, you know, it's a mental health challenge or whatever. I mean, this is part, part of all this work for me has been around better preparing myself to be more resilient and resilient, is such a broad word. And, you know, when you think about the energy piece, it's, it's so funny, but everyone talks about, well, you know, how much sleep are you getting? 
like sleep's the one thing. If you're not getting enough sleep, like nothing else functions and works. So, you know, I think for me, going back to even the commentary on procrastination, not getting enough sleep was a thing where it's like a deep sleep, you know, like REM sleep. And, and that's been an issue throughout my, my whole life, you know? So I know that thing first well, firsthand so well. So trying to create, carve, you know, say no, uh, do less, um, and just do that has been probably one of the hardest challenges. So the sleep piece for me has been the biggest challenge, but also the greatest reward in ensuring that at least my energy levels across everything, my, my logical brain, my subconscious brain, et cetera, are balanced. Chris, that's it. What, what are your thoughts about energy and the best ways to maintain and use the energy you have? Well, I think part of that is steeped in what do you want to give out? What do you want to give off? I made a commitment and I've been working on that commitment for a while is that I wanted to give good energy in, in any situation where I'm allowed to give good energy uh, with the idea that if I gave good energy, in it, good energy will return back to me. I know that you go into certain situations and you know, let's just say it's a, you know, it's a, it, it's a challenge or you, 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 you run into someone who's maybe they're diametrically opposed to what you're about. So they're giving off, you know, so that this where the struggle comes in. So they're giving you this, this wall of bad, you know, like, cause, you know, cause everybody, ha I always say this, everybody has an agenda. Everybody. It's an individualistic type of thing that we all carry my, you know, agenda can be substituted for goals, but at the, at the root of a goal, there is an agenda. So a lot of times when people are really convicted to those agendas or those goals, sometimes they put up this, this, this kind of negative energy field, like I'm going to get what I want. And you don't understand what I have come to understand is that you, in a lot of cases, you don't win. You know what I mean? There's no there's no realistic chance of winning. Um, you may win that battle, but ultimately my goal is to win the war. So you've got, it's, it's what you've got to put into it to, to do that. Um, so whenever I encounter a situation where sometimes you can see it from a mile away that this is a negative situation I'm walking into. And I'm, and my goal is to affect it in a, to effect it in a positive manner. So that's, that's what motivates me because that's kind of where I'm, that's kind of what I've discovered about my life is that I want to, uh, I want to affect positive change and goals and, and outcomes within situations that I encounter in my daily travels. And be honest, to be honest, it is a lot of work. You've got to literally focus on that. You know, if you have that ability to look at something from a distance and say, okay, I, I, I can identify that there are going to be challenges here, but I'm not going to elect I'm not going to let that affect my approach and process. I'm still, my goal is still my goal, which is to affect something. Sometimes it's about changing somebody's mindset who only thinks that it's just, it's all downhill. And you, you gotta, you know, and that's, I'll be honest with you on, on certain given days, that's a fight I'm willing to take on. You know, I, I actually relish that, the idea to turn something negative into something positive. And I actually am starting to believe in my life that that's what that's one of my purposes, my why, as you like to say, is to try to affect positive change. And it's not about the necessarily the numbers. Sometimes it's just one, <laughs> believe it or not, it's just one. So um, that's that consultive. That's a that's that consultive piece, where that's how I'm viewing. I'm starting to view myself in my life as somewhat of a consultant for good. But like I said, it's a conscious decision at the end of the day to, to provide good energy. You can go either way. It's your decision. How are you going to use it? And I think for me this year, I've been getting more and more interested in brain health and making sure that the amount of sleep that I receive, uh, being mindful of what I'm eating, the good and the bad, and how mm -hmm. that's impacting how I feel and really observing others and how they eat <laughs> and how uh, their bodies are reacting or providing them the energy to do what they 
feel they need to do and the emotional um the emotional bandwidth to handle what they need i think that's been a big interest of mine uh, in 2024 is that brain health and protecting my mind so that i will have the energy to focus on what i need to focus on uh, and I, i've been encouraging other people to do the same uh, a lot of our reactions really stem from you know of course our brain and if we don't get adequate rest, if we're not drinking enough water, if we're not getting uh, adequate nutrition, then that really impacts the energy that we have. And it can really affect the room, the rooms that we're in. So protecting the, protecting the mind, protecting the brain. So it's interesting, you know, we, uh, far too often we talk about like our brain as being the center or the heart, whatnot. It's, I think in, in most recently, uh, I've been coming to the conclusion actually that our gut is our primary, our primary brain first and foremost, because, you know, all our serotonin, like all the good stuff. Again, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're hungry or feeling starved, I mean, it's our, our, our gut drives everything so much. And then, you know, then it's our brain and whatnot, because the gut feeds the brain and whatnot. So it's just interesting. Um, playing a much, much greater role of treating your gut with, uh, you know, obviously filling with great nutrition and, you know, not processed foods and chemicals. And uh, as you said, Erica, you know, all the other things required to it do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of um, uh, ailments that we have in the, the Black culture really stem from that, what's going mm. on in our gut. You know, what are we feeding our children? Uh, are, are those foods giving them really the energy to sit in the classroom and learn? And are they getting the amount of rest that they need? Um, uh, we might be feel, feeding our children a whole bunch more carbs than what they should be having. And then they're not getting sleep. So when they get into class, maybe they're up, but then soon they crash and they're not focusing. And then everything else that you said about the gut, what, what it brings, what a healthy gut can provide. Uh, to your overall well-being is pretty major. And I don't think we're talking about that, talking about that enough in communities of color. And, and uh, if our children aren't focused in school, well, that kind of, that kind of can lead all kinds of roads, right? Uh, for many of them uh, acting out in school or dropping out of school, um, not doing as well as they really could do in school. Uh, not pursuing, you know, a vocational license or a degree that can get them, you know, a, a job that can take care of themselves, not just a degree, but a job that can actually bring in money um, or, you know, uh, keep them focused enough to enter into the military and rise through the ranks of the military. A lot of that does stem from, you know, the gut. And are we keeping our children uh, healthy enough to succeed or to fulfill their, you know, all their potential. It goes back to what Chris always harps on too, and that's about habits, right? So if the, as a young person, you are get into this habit of not caring for your gut and then, you know, putting the wrong things in, et cetera, et cetera. And it carries on into adulthood, mm -hmm. then that same pattern and trend is going to continue and continue to impact your energy levels and mm -hmm. um, many other things in your life because you've established this, roadmap that you know is it too late to change it never and that's kind of what we're talking about here is it is a journey as chris mentioned a little, little bit ago too about this is a day in day out process of working your way through it one step at a time so we just have to keep doing that and unless a family is a family of athletes typically they're not talking about you know your fiber intake <laughs> your water intake they're, they're just not as focused. A family of athletes, they're, they're monitoring all that. But that, that's really a conversation we all could, should be having more. I want to share an accomplishment. I, I okay. want to leave today with something positive that I'm very proud of. Um, you, you folks know that we've, I've talked about it in the past about, um, you know, I'm a, <laughs> I like to say I'm the, I used to be the fat kid. You know, that's what I like to say. And you look, some people are like, you couldn't have, you weren't the fat kid because there's fatter kids. Well, in my mind, I was the fat kid. Okay. My folks fed me whatever. I mean, we, we didn't have a refrigerator that wasn't full of food and I could pretty much unabashedly eat anything I wanted. 
And there was no, no, Chris, do a little exercise, do a little strength. Anyway, you guys know that I went through this thing with my health issues last year where I was stuck in the house for four months with that tumor on my eye. I gained 30 pounds. And I've been trying to figure out through this whole process how to how to get back up, you know, how to get back up on, you know, upright and moving in the right direction. I'm a gym guy. I'm a, I, I'm a sports guy. You know, I swim. Um, a couple months ago, maybe two and three months ago, you know, through my conversations with Benny, we were talking about um, – working out and uh and i've been trying to find my way again in that arena um and he started talking to me about intermittent fasting which i didn't know anything about mm -hmm. and it was for it was foreign to me uh, i started doing some research i started to apply that research to myself um it it's a drastic change um but we're i'm two and a half months and change in and i'm 16 pounds down Oh, congrats. My confidence wow. with each pound going down, my confidence is exponentially rising. Uh, my goal was to do 30 pounds uh, mm -hmm. off. Uh, I realized at this halfway point, because I'll just call it, we'll just call it the halfway point, that I'm now going to have to break this down into five pound goals, incremental goals to lose weight, because it gets at, at my age, it gets more, you know, you can't just starve yourself. Yeah. It has to be a process in all this. But I'm, I want you guys to understand that. I'm fully committed to this now. Uh, I enjoy it. It is it is one of the things that gets me up in the morning uh, mm -hmm. because I also look at this from the standpoint that my other professional goals are going to benefit as well if I'm in tip-top performing shape. So yes. they, they go hand in hand together. Uh, and it is such it has been such a motivating tool now that I'm I've got the train kind of on the tracks. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm excited. I mean, I get up every day and I, and, and I, I think about that, you know, and, and that helps me to springboard into every other thing that I'm doing in my life and every other goal that I have in my life. It is steeped behind this physical health uh, transformation that I'm going through right now. You, you think yeah. about not eating? Is that is what I'm hearing you say? What did you say? You think about not eating? Well, no, no, no. I actually think about eating. I like eating. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to wake up. It's gonna starve myself. Let's do this. <laughs> well, but here's the crazy part. I don't look at I don't look at it as starving myself. I look at it as a as a as a verifiable process I that know, I'm going I'm through. Sure. That it was something that I didn't do in the past, and I was mm -hmm. I was uninformed. Now I'm informed, and now I'm and I've seen the results, and so I'm now a believer which is, is is part of sometimes changing your mindset. Yeah. This is about a mindset change. It's what this is really about. So what I'm saying is if I am if I can do it, anybody can do it if you put your mind to it. That's what I'm saying. Thank you for sharing that, Chris. That's awesome. And this has been great. Uh, we I think we've covered so many topics here that really can help people start to break through those barriers of self-imposed limiting beliefs. Obviously a big part of it is fear. And we talked about mm -hmm. both fear of failure and fear of success and getting beyond that, uh, figuring out what your personal beliefs and values are all about. So you have that also in line and then energy and effort and focusing on the action, not the end result. So taking the journey and, and being at peace with that also I think is of value. But the last thing I want to say is, you know, we talk about a little person on our shoulder. Start to play this little tape if you if you're still challenged. And it's actually just three words. And it's why not me? And not why not me question mark, why not me exclamation point. And just start to use that as your mantra. Why not me? Meaning you're worthy, meaning you're deserving, meaning you can do it. Why not me? And just start to let that be the thing that carries you forward. So that's my last bit of advice for breaking through those barriers of all of those self-imposed things that tend to hold us back and not let us truly live uh, to our fullest potential and live as our best selves. Panel, this has been great. I want to thank each and every one of you for all of your input. So until next time, you guys take care. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. We'll definitely see you soon. Bye now. Thank you.